Well, we're back on the Only One Shot Golf Podcast. I'm Jim Gallagher, Jr., and I'm your host. Special thanks to Steve Azar for allowing us to use his music, and you can find Steve at steveazar.com. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at onlyoneshotgolf at gmail.com. Check us out on Instagram, uh, or you can follow me on Twitter at GallagherJRGC. So uh, check us out. We appreciate all those uh, folks who have been listening, and uh, we appreciate uh, the loyal listeners we've had over the last couple of years. But this is going to be a fun podcast. I have Emma Talley who played at the University of Alabama, won the U.S. Uh, Am in 2013, the NCAAs as an individual in 2015. This is going to be her fourth year on the LPGA. A delightful young lady, grew up in the small little town, Princeton, Kentucky. Uh, a lot of personality, got her game turned around last year, and it's going to be fun to hear her story. Grew up with Russ Cochran and, and his sons, and uh, it's a cool story. So let's get to know uh, Emma Talley just a little bit better. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Emma Talley to the podcast. Emma, thanks so much for spending some time with me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be fun. I've been watching you play since you were a little junior player, and now you're on the LPGA. You played at Alabama, which is hard for a Tennessee guy to say. But but who got you started playing, and who really was some of your big influences early on? Um, I didn't. I played every sport growing up, and no one in my family played golf. Um, believe it or not. So we lived on a golf course and I fell in love with the game at a very, at nine years old. And I remember the only thing I would ever get in trouble with is not coming, being home for dinner at the right time. Um, <laughs> we lived on the 16th hole and my mom would always say, make sure you're on this hole by dark. And if I wasn't, that was like the only thing I got in trouble for. But I love golf so much. Um, I'm not really a golf nerd at all. I don't I looked up to Annika as a kid growing up, uh-huh. um, but honestly, I just I just loved the game, and I fell in love with it and kind of just did my own thing. How was playing the other sports? How much did that help you in, in, in playing golf? I mean, I, I talk to people all the time that I think it's important that kids play all sports early on. Uh, how important was it for you to play those other sports and, and when you did finally fall in love with golf? Yeah, I am. Um, you know, I... I think playing other sports is huge. I think it gives you, uh, first of all, it gets cold in Kentucky in the winter. So Mm -hmm. for me, it was just honestly something to do. And my dad always said he wanted me to play so I wouldn't get injured in golf. And it kept me in shape. It kept me social. It kept me out of trouble. Um, I I loved playing other sports. I really regret quitting basketball as early as I did. But I had an offer from Alabama. And I broke my nose, and I thought, if I break any other bones, I'm going to be in big trouble. So <laughs> I, ended up, I ended up quitting, but I loved basketball. That was my favorite. Um, yeah, my daughter Mary Landon was a basketball player. She broke her nose as well uh, before she played college golf. So, but it is good for you to play. But you you grew up and you knew the Cochran brothers and uh, Russ Cochran. Did they? How was it playing against the boys? Because I, I know my girls had to play against the boys. What was that like playing against the boys? And what'd you learn from them? Oh, uh, the Cochran family. I would say Russ is someone else who I looked up to. Whenever I was ten years old, I remember some of his older boys were playing basketball. And I went over and my, my dad said, that's Rush Cocker. And I went over and gave got his autograph. And I still give him a hard time that I have it up on my bulletin <laughs> board in my, in my room at my parents' house still. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was so lucky. I feel like all those guys, Murray State University was just down the road for me. And um, a lot of good golfers, a lot of guy golfers went there um, from around Western Kentucky. And then, obviously, Case was – I remember growing up in – I I was like maybe 11 years old and he was in high school and here I am like a little kid and I walked up to him and said you want to have a chipping contest and I remember he would just play with like we would play games all day long and he was so good to me and it's people like that that really kind of elevated my game probably at a young age because I was allowed to play with the older kids and the older guys and I, would, I remember asking him how to hit out of the bunker and um, Case was Case is an awesome guy, still is an awesome guy, and I haven't talked to him in a long time, but um, he definitely helped me. Yeah, those guys were uh, very good players, and Russ was. I mean, he's the one that kind of turned me on and, and mentioned talking about you because he knew my girls played, and, and you mentioned you went to Alabama. What was that? Rec- yeah. What was that recruiting process like for you? Because you were a very good junior player, and I'm sure you had a lot of opportunities and chances to go other places. But what was it like, and why did you choose Alabama? Yeah, I was the number one recruit for my year, but it started 
really young. I remember at the U.S. Girls Junior when I was, I think I was 12 years old. Um, he was the coach at Arizona at the time, um, and now he's the coach at Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. And um, he he asked me, he was from the same hometown as my mom, and so his name's Greg Allen, and he came up to my parents and was like, we would love to have her. And I was like, I was so little, my dad. My dad knew nothing about golf. And he was like, what in the world? These people are already recruiting. Because at that time, you could talk to them up until high school. So mm-hmm. I was getting all these offers in middle school. And it was crazy. It was so crazy. Um, but, yeah, I was lucky enough to be able to go kind of wherever I wanted to go. And I looked everywhere and loved every school. I went to, I said, oh, this is it. This is it. <laughs> um, I mean, it was amazing. All the, all the schools have great facilities. But – Alabama stuck out. It, it definitely was the, the. It was just the best. I mean, I wanted to go somewhere that wasn't too far away from home. I wanted to go south, and they won the national championships on the on the girls' side in 2012, um, which I went in the fall of 2012. So they were really good, and they were always ranked really high. And uh, Mick Potter started watching me when I was like, I think in middle school as well. He offered me when I was in eighth grade, and um, he got Nick Saban to. To, enter, to to come out of his office whenever I was a junior in high school and I hadn't committed yet. And I'll never forget it. Nick Saban walked out of the room and said, in Italian, started listing everything I'd accomplished. And um, he said, so are you going to commit or not? <laughs> and I, th- I thought that was hilarious. I mean, he was like, this is where champions are made. Are you going to be a part of it? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I ended up committing like the next week. But I made him late for the bus. Um it was just a cool experience. I'd never been anywhere. Looking back, I, you know, coming being from a small town, it's so cool to go to a school that everybody there is so successful. And I'd never been around anyone like that. Um, my roommate in college won back-to-back national championships in doubles tennis. Wow. Um, my other roommate, she was the captain of the soccer team. The guy I dated at the time won the gold glove on the baseball team. It was just like everyone around you was so successful. And it's just, it's, it was just so cool. And uh, I wish that I, I feel like I took it for granted a little bit at the time. Looking back, I, now that I'm on tour, I'm like, I wish I could go back because those are the days. <laughs> the one. You were around all those great athletes. What was some of the things, what were some of the things y'all would talk about and the feelings you had when you were in competition that maybe helped you with golf? Yeah, I think it's just a good it's good to be able to have people that are like-minded around you. We, we totally, the, the day we won the national championship on the same day, we called each other about an hour after all the celebrating. And she was like, wow, that's it. And we were shocked at what you felt like after you, you know, all the preparation and then you win the biggest event you can. And it just feels like a win. And then you move on, you stuff go to school the next day. So I think it was really cool for me to be able to have someone like that just around me that understood all the emotions all the stress that you, we put into winning and then you know I think just the perspective of life we still had to go to school the next day so I mean I think you said it best everybody at Alabama was so successful you felt you felt bad if you didn't win because everyone else around you was winning and I think that was just that was the culture and um, it was it was so cool to be a part of yeah, you know, Dr. Coop, who we've lost uh, back about a week or two ago, I don't know if you knew him, he was a sports psychologist, he's actually from Kentucky, he worked with so many great players, and one thing he told me is, as I struggled a little bit, he says, you've got to be you on and off the golf course, you have to be that same person, and uh, you and I have somewhat similar personalities, you have a better personality than me, but I like to talk, I like to be interact with people, people energize me. And, and I felt like there were times where I jumped in and went back into that, oh my gosh, I got to be a, you know, stoic. I can't have the fun. And I think everybody goes through that. But you mentioned changes and switching around. Lydia Ko did all those things. Uh, that's great advice for those young players. Not to, you know, whatever got you out there, stick with that. And, and don't you think it's t- don't you think it's tough when you get out there when you struggle? Hey. Uh, maybe I need to change coaches. Maybe I need to change this and that. And that's not necessarily the answer. And, um, I mean, like I said, I could talk about this all day because I, I try to preach to all my friends that come out, like, just keep doing what you're doing because um, you you know yourself, you know your DNA, what makes you good. And I wish I would have 
Stacey Lewis right before I turned pro told me, don't change anything the first three years. And I, and I wish I would have listened to her because it would have made me a lot more money and maybe a couple wins in there. But I didn't. I, I, I only gave it one year, and then, and then I changed everything. So um, I'm back with my old coach. I'm back doing what the things that I used to do, and I'm finally seeing some results again. So um, it's been a long two years, but I'm still on the tour, and I think that was that's pretty cool in my eyes. Is that a struggle? And what are the challenges there? Because I know for myself, it took eight years, like I said, to, before I won on the PGA Tour. And then that second time became easier and easier because I got more comfortable and I was able to be me. Uh, how hard is it to be patient when you know you're good enough now? And you mentioned May, you had a great tournament and things turned around. How hard is it to be patient when things are tough? Because I know a lot of our listeners are young players. They go through the same struggles as the pros. How tough is it to be patient when those times are like that? Yeah, for sure, and that's what I did. I mean, I, I freaked out because I didn't win. And like I said, if you look at my stats my rookie year, I, had, I think I had, I don't remember how many top fives and top tens, but I had several. And as a rookie, I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good start. And, um, but I freaked out because I didn't win. And I think too many times we, and now I work, with a mental, I work with a mental coach now, so I know what to say in this, but um, – you know, you you not only need to know what makes you good, but you have to trust yourself and kind of let the results take care of themselves. And my dad had always preached that growing up, like prepare as hard as you can, enjoy the enjoy the game, and then let the results take care of themselves. And I kind of forgot that part. And in all. I just wrote down, control what you can control, just before it came out of your mouth. I wish you could see it. I mean, I truly did write that down because it's so true. I mean, in life on the LPGA or the PGA Tour, it's a lonely, tough life. I mean, what are those challenges like? Because, you know, you start missing a few cuts or sitting in a hotel room. COVID, you were restricted on what you can and can't do. That had to be tough mentally for, you know, we all talk about it. That had to be tough for you all as well because I know what it's like uh, before my family and when my family quit uh, traveling. Yeah, it's very hard, especially when you put all the time and effort and you feel like, why isn't this working? Why Why is it not my turn? I put so much time and effort into this, and then it doesn't happen. But I think uh, my I work with a mental coach, like I said, and um, he really preaches that a ban- to, to grow a bamboo tree, it takes five years to, to, to actually go through the ground. You can't dig up and make sure the roots are, are growing. You just keep having to water it and make sure it gets enough sunshine every day. And after five years, once it once it comes through the ground, it grows 150 feet in, in six months. And so he continually preaches to me, you know, if you keep doing all the right things every single day, eventually your time will come. And, and now I have a new perspective. And even though I did struggle, um, I have a lot of new people on my team now that I'm very thankful for. So I think through that struggle, I got better. Um, but it was a tough couple of years, and I'm trying to take the positives. And then, like I said, I've gained um, my mental coach, who I just think is the world of. I think he's amazing. And he's he's changed my life, not just golf, but he's changed my life. Um, so I, I really am so thankful for to have a good team around me. What's his name, Emma? His name's Paul Doolin. He's out of Orlando. He's Canadian. Um, he works with several golfers, um, but he's he he really has. He is. I've tried other mental coaches, and it just hasn't worked out. And I've worked with him for over a year now, and it, it's I talk to him every week, and he's he's great. He really has like changed how I think and how I feel. Even I used to get so worked up about about get a flight getting canceled or missing a flight, and 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 it would stress me out. And when you travel all the time, those things can really bog you down. And finally, he was like, you can only control what you can control. And I think, especially golfers and people that play sport, uh, uh, sports, you know, we all want to be in control so much. And there's just some things you just can't control. And one thing you can control is how you prepare. And so that's kind of my, my game plan, just prepare as hard as you can enjoy enjoy golf because I, I still love golf which I'm very thankful for and then let the results take care of them themselves life on the LPGA can be very lonely and very challenging you know tell us you know what's it like it's got to be some tough times out there when you're by yourself a lot 
Yeah, it, it's really hard at times, for sure. And uh, my brother always jokes and says, come work at his plant, and then I'll stop complaining. So I want to put that out there first, that even though there are tough, tough parts, I mean, it's it's the best. I'm getting to play golf for a living. But the loneliness side of it and um, the grind, when, when it's going great, it's going amazing. And when it's not going well, it, it just feels like your dominoes just keep on falling because it's the grind. It's week in, week out. You don't really get days off. And, um, yeah, it's a lot. So, And you miss everything. Like all my friends, I'm 27, so all my friends are getting married right now and having kids, and I'm missing all of it. Um, but the good thing is FaceTime and technology, I, I at least get to feel like I'm there. So, um, yeah, it's hard. It's very hard. And um, But if I, if I want to do this job, I've, I just got to deal with it. So, um, thank goodness the tour, we have a great family out there. I'm, I'm close to a lot of the girls. I travel with a lot of the girls and that obviously really helps. Absolutely. And you've played against the elite players, junior college, now on the pro level. What separates that elite player maybe from the rest? Uh, and cause you were, and you, and you are, you're an elite player. You're on the LPGA. Uh, what separates maybe that elite player, maybe from the, uh, the average player that's out there, maybe listening. You know, it's a great question. I have, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I don't know. Um, I, my dad was talking to me yesterday. He's a, he's a really smart guy, he, um, and he was saying he was reading a book about people's IQ, and basically someone's IQ can only be so high, but what separates the people who become geniuses and who just are, are intelligent are the people who keep working at it. And so I think, obviously, there's a certain talent level that you have to have to get get on the LPGA. But I think the people that, that win are the ones that work hard the hardest. And, yeah, you have to have some lucky draws here and there. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it gets down to it. I even told my boyfriend, who caddies on the LPGA, um, I don't know if you've seen the Marty Fish documentary on Netflix. But, mm-hmm. I've seen it. I haven't watched it yet, but I heard it's good. Oh, I cried through the whole thing because I felt so much anxiety through it because I feel like I knew what he felt like. But I had told mm-hmm. my boyfriend right after I watched that, I said, you know, there as you get older, things become important to you that weren't important to you when you were 15. And I have noticed that I still put a lot of time and effort into it, but I have a house now, and I have to take care of the house, and I have to take care of the bills, and I have to do my laundry when I was 15, I didn't have to do any of that. So I think the, the people that are the best are the people that are, are able to put all their time and time and effort into golf still. And some girls are very lucky in that they have like a whole team that travels with them, whereas other girls don't. And like I said, I have a boyfriend who needs to hurry up and pop the question, by the way, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> We're putting him on the spot. <laughs> but, you know, there's other things that are important in my life now. I have nieces and I have, I have three siblings. And um, I told my boyfriend, I said, I would love to work really hard the next three years to become number one and be done with this. Um, but you have to sacrifice a lot to do that. And I think that's the difference. I think all of us are probably as talented as the next person. But it's it's those that can put the most effort into it and the most time into it. Yeah, it's an inner drive. It's also that time management that you had to do in college. As you mentioned, I had to take tests. I had to still exactly. work hard. I had to work out. It's all the same thing. It's just at a different level. It's tough being a grown-up. Yeah. Trust me, I'm 60. And I'm still, I'm it's still crazy. learning. I'm still learning. I mean, my mental coach, it's, it's finally, he said, he was like, you know, Emma, I think it might be worth dropping your finding a drop-off service for your laundry every week because – that's two hours of your time, you know, and it because you have to sit there at the laundromat. You you can't. It's not like a yeah. home where you put it in and then you can do something and then go back. You have to sit there yep. with it. So sometimes it takes me two to three hours to do my laundry. And he's like, you know, I think I think it's time to learn to manage this and just spend the twenty dollars and let someone else do it for you. So I'm learning every step of the way. It's my. It's going to be my. What is it? It's going to be my fourth year on tour next year, and I'm still learning every time, every week. You'll continue to learn. You sound, you know, my wife learned that quickly at LSU when she was down there. Her first year, she learned, oh, you could drop this off? This is simple. Yeah. Oh, she figured that out early. So, <laughs> uh, you, I'm glad you figured that out. I've got to do that myself. Sometimes sitting in there trying to just kind of think about life 
uh, is fun. But after sitting there for two hours doing your laundry, it's not the greatest thing when you've got other things to do. But you mentioned getting it rolling last year. I think it was Ireland when things turned around. I sent you a text. Uh, what changed that week mentally and what happened? Did you kind of maybe just finally just free yourself of the pressure and just play and be Emma Talley? Yeah, I I didn't have a lot of great weeks last year, but I had a few. And I missed the first five cuts last year. And then three months later, I'm in a playoff to win. And I played the playoff terribly, but that's a whole other story. But, um, yeah, it was crazy. I kept telling my dad. My dad kept saying, you know, what's going on? I'm like, I'm so close. I'm so close to playing so well. I think it was the confidence. Um, I went back to my old coach at the beginning of the year. Here. every week I just felt a little more confident in my game and what I was trying to do and and that week it all just kind of clicked and I think when you I think I shot seven under the first round I think when you start off hot um for me at least because I'd missed so many cuts as you know when you when you're when you shoot even you got to shoot a couple under the next day yeah it's it gets to you. So I've actually stopped looking at the leaderboard. That was one of the first weeks I stopped looking at the leaderboard. Obviously, by the end of the week, I, I knew where I was just because of my tea time. But um, I had stopped looking at the leaderboards completely and and just trying to make as many birdies and pars as I could. And and I felt comfortable. And it, it was just a great week. And I, I had another good finish last year and um, in Dallas. And it just all kind of fed off of each other. And Hopefully this year I have a lot more chances because I, I feel even better than I did last year, even um, even in Ireland. So I'm hoping that if doing all the right things, it'll do. Sounds like, you, sounds like you were allowing yourself to control what you could control. And I think that's a big, big part of that. Uh, what are expectations yeah. and goals for this season? What are you, you know, what are you expecting out of yourself this season? What are some of your goals? I know this is so cliche of me to say, but it truly nope. is what I'm trying to trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to just stick to what I've promised myself. For example, there's those leaderboards all over the golf course. And every time I look at it, I get so stressed out. So one of the things I'm going to do is really try not to look at them. And it's really hard to do, but um, there's nothing – it doesn't help anything. Um, sometimes it gives you a little motivation, like if you're – one shot off the lead or something, but um, in the big scheme of, of, of golf, I'm just going to try to stick to my process and, and remember who I am, remember my DNA, try to really commit to everything that I'm doing because I know it's all it's all right, right things that it'll pay off. So it's hard to do that because there's so many good players around you. You try to figure out what they're doing while they're being successful. So, it's hard to stick in your own lane, but I'm going to try to do that this year. That's really my only goal. Um, as far as, like, big goals, I really w- would love to play on the Solheim Cup team, and that's basically mm-hmm. that's basically the goal. I mean, I want to be I want to play for the United States in the Solheim Cup, and that, that's the big goal. Well, you can do it. One thing you got to do, try this, and this is what I always did. I, I, you know, when you first see your name on the leaderboard and you're first on tour, it kind of freaks you out. But get comfortable and expect your name to be up on that leaderboard. When you see your name up there, go, hey, it's supposed to be up. Yeah, yeah. I'm and good. I, think, I, I, think, tell, I tell my mental coach all the time, I'm good if it's at the top. I start freaking out when it's on that on the bubble of making the cut and not. <laughs> That's when I, I, I go nuts. So I've got I've well, to figure that out. Think of it this way: when you're when you're barely on the cut, you're not playing at the level you are when you're at the top of the leaderboard. So that is pressure. I always felt more pressure trying to make the cut than I did trying to win the tournament. Same. I know that sounds insane, but it's true because you, when you're playing well, you're confident yes. and you're expecting to play well. When yes. you're on that bubble, you're like things aren't exactly right. Right. So I mean, that's a it's a great approach. You're, you're approaching it the right way, and I think that's a big plus of it. But on a personal note, and we talked about this, your hometown in the state of Kentucky hit with the tornadoes, uh, and, and, and you saw the devastation and everything. Can you update us on how things are going at home and how we can help out? And I know you and I talked about maybe having a, a you're going to have a tournament maybe this spring. Can you kind of update us on how things are going there back home? Yeah, thank you for mentioning it. Um, I just got, so I've been in New Zealand for a the last month and I got to go home actually this past weekend and see the damage with my own eyes and it's just crazy um so many people lost their homes and it's so sad because um 
you know, a lot of people that thought their homes were okay, they're actually not. They're cracking now, so they're going to have to demolish their homes as well. So, you know, people lost everything. The good thing is, and I hate to use this word, but because they're not lucky, but the place where it hit in Princeton, everyone, almost everyone survived in Princeton. And I think that mm-hmm. was like a huge blessing. Um, most people had basements in in and around the golf course where it hit. Um, if it would have hit on a different side of town, that wouldn't have been the case. So I think we were very blessed. However, people lost everything, um, all their possessions, trophies and all their pictures. You know, they lost everything. Um, so people are just needing homes right now. They need home. We need contractors to build homes. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure everybody on here knows how insurance works. I mean, people are just, they're not getting quite as much as they thought. So it's just, it's just sad. Um, but the good thing is we have each other. Um, we're going to do a golf tournament, I think, um, in May. That I'm going to try to get some pros on the LPJ and PJ tours to come down for. Um, so we're going to try to do that. That's a work in, work in progress. And then I'm going to do something the first week, in, week of the LPJ event in Boca. Um, I'm not just – probably a hundred dollar birdies and try to get a bunch of people to do it. Um, my, I got my local chamber of commerce. They put a, together a GoFundMe page. So that's what we've been donating to, to help people kind of get, get on their feet again. So, um, yeah, it, it's tragic. And the town's next to us, a lot of government housing and a lot of people died. So, um, it's just really sad, but a lot of prayers are needed and, uh, it was nice to see some of my, some of my neighbors that I could hug their neck because their home is gone, but I got to see them. Exactly, it's all about perspective, and and we and, and sometimes people forget about. You know, they go on to the next thing. We go on with our lives and we forget about it. You think of Lake Charles and the things they went through just a year or so with the hurricanes and everybody. And it takes time. And it's just, this is going to take time and healing. We just got to keep them, like you said, keep them in your prayers. And if you can help out, help out. Uh, what's the name of your Chamber of Commerce, the GoFundMe page, that if someone wants that's listening wants to make a donation, that, what's the name of that? It's actually called the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I think it's called the Chamber of Commerce or Princeton. It's on my Instagram page, um, on my bio, and... Uh, you'll see it. I, I mean, I'm going to be posting a lot about it in the upcoming weeks. So, um, yeah, now my parents' ha- neighborhood got hit as well. Their house didn't. Two houses down did. It's crazy how tornadoes work. But you can see all the way through the golf course to our friend's house that is is so far away, and, and everything's just gone. So it's very – it's tragic. And you're right. It's going to take five to ten years to rebuild what, what was lost. So – just very sad for our small we only have four stoplights in my community so very small knit community and it's going to take a long time absolutely and you you mentioned you 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 live in a small town we'll go into another thing what's it like traveling the world not just the u.s but traveling the world in the lpga do you ever have that pinch me moment going like wow guess what i get to do today i get to go play golf (laughs) yeah it's so funny. My whole town, there's a home of a Metallic sign when you pull into Princeton, Kentucky. Um, everyone there is so supportive. It's so cool growing up in a small town like that because everyone's so uh, supportive and everyone knows exactly. People know what, I, what I'm doing before <laughs> I even know what I'm doing. So they, they are so supportive. I'm so lucky to be from a small town. I think it's the best. Um, my boyfriend is from New Zealand. And he's like the star of the town because no one's ever heard an accent like this. So it's just, it's just fun, you know. Everyone just, it's just a great place to live and grow up. And uh, I try to share as much as I can with them that I get to do. So it's very cool. Absolutely. Okay. The big question. And when this podcast comes out, we'll know the answer. But uh, there's kind of a big football game going to be happening. And you're talking about titles. Oh. Alabama's playing Georgia. you got to give me a prediction. And, and I know who you're pulling. Yeah, out obviously. you got to give me a prediction. I, I'm going to say roll tide all the way because I think Georgia is okay. playing better right now. But I think we know how to get it done when it comes down to it. And I think the confidence was built the last couple of weeks is huge we were kind of in a slump there i felt like for a little bit and then the last few wins that we've had i think the team looks 
really good. So I think Nick Saban knows how to win, and I think we're going to win it. There you go. And Roll you're driving pod. through Georgia. And see, when this when this podcast comes out, we had to do a little editing because I think the Georgia <laughs> fans were messing with our reception. Uh, you know, a Tennessee guy, an Alabama guy. But it's uh, uh, but I appreciate you spending some time with us. You be safe going back home. And I'll see you in Boca. I'm actually calling the golf down there that week. And Perfect. I'll get to spend some time with you. And if I can help you out with the tornado, if, if the tournament, if it works in my schedule, please call me. Yeah, great. Uh, I don't play much golf, but we'll have a good time and uh, we'll figure it out. Perfect. Thank you so much thank you Emma well, Todd. well I hope you enjoyed today's podcast with Emma Talley I appreciate her uh, spending some time with her with us uh, on her drive down to Georgia leaving uh, home in Kentucky and getting down there getting ready for the uh, LPGA season tough night for her Crimson Tide as they lost to Georgia but uh, we appreciate uh, her prediction her love of the University of Alabama but uh, as you get out there, don't forget to get your copy of Only One Shot. That's available at Amazon. It was written by VJ Trollio. And uh, remember, whether life or golf, you may have only one shot. you got to make it count. Until next time, we'll see you later.